It is my pleasure to introduce Hank Hanegraaff this afternoon. Hank is widely regarded as one of the world's leading apologists, and it is a real privilege to have him here at the University of Southern California. Hank is the president of the Christian Research Institute and is deeply committed to equipping Christians to be constituted with the truth, which is found in the Word of God. Hank holds the nationally syndicated Bible Answer Man radio program. This program is a live call-in radio program where Hank takes on all questions, answering them uh, with the basis of careful research and sound reasoning, and also always bringing listeners back to the Word of God. Hank's writing, research, and audio programs are also available on this website, equip.org. And now, it is my great honor to welcome to the stage a renowned teacher and minister, and our brother in Christ. Well, thank you very much for that warm welcome. I am delighted to be here this afternoon. I didn't know I would be here three days ago. And I am particularly grateful for the USC Christian Students on Campus Club for making this arrangement. And I find it highly ironic that I am speaking here by their invitation because it wasn't all that long ago when we started a primary research project uh, on the local churches, and many of uh, those who were involved with USC Christian students uh, worship with the local churches uh, around the world. And uh, we, we thought this group was a, an aberrant group at best. And I met with the leaders uh, back in August 4, 2003, and they confronted me with their doctrine, suggesting that they did not believe what we had as a primary research organization said they believed, which is that they were the only church. And they said, no, we don't believe that. We believe that we are only the church. We thought that they believed that they could become like God is in the Godhead. And they said, no, we don't believe that. We believe in deification very much in the sense that Peter talked about deification, becoming partakers of the divine nature through sanctification. And then uh, we thought that they were modalists, uh, that they believed that God revealed himself in different modes or manifestations, and they said, no, we don't believe that. We're thoroughly Trinitarian. We believe in one God revealed in three persons who are eternally distinct. Now, I was faced with a dilemma as president of the Christian Research Institute. What happens when someone looks you in the eye involved in a ministry and tells you point blank, no, what you say we believe is not really what we believe. So we started uh, six years ago now, almost seven years ago, a primary research project. And out of that, we ended up doing an article in the Christian Research Journal, which ended up encompassing the entirety of the journal. And the words on the cover of the journal were, we were wrong. And the reason that we overtly communicated we were wrong is because truth matters. That's our moniker. Uh, that's the statement by which we abide and live and guide our organization. Truth matters. We are followers of the one who said he is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by him. So, again, I find it highly ironic that I am here on behalf of USC Christian students on campus. Many of them have become my dear friends, and they are an expression of authentic New Testament Christianity, and I have learned to love them and grow with them, have fellowship with them, and sense of oneness with them as we seek to do what we have been commissioned to do, and that is to be salt and light in a lost and searching world. So what caused a Christian to do what they did? Well, the early Christians knew that Christ 
had risen from the dead. And therefore, they no longer lived for mean earthly vanities. They elevated their gaze to eternal verities. They looked beyond the temporary to the eternal because they had seen Christ die and they had seen Christ rise. And therefore, they knew that like their master, they too would rise immortal, imperishable, incorruptible. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, they would be changed from mortality to immortality. And so many of them died in hippodromes with smiles on their faces and songs on their lips because they knew their eternal destiny was certain. Paul said this, now brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you believed and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as first importance that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared first to Peter, then to the twelve, then to over 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living, said Paul, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also, says Paul, as one abnormally born. For I'm the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And this grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them. Yet not I, but the Spirit of God that was within me. But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection from the dead? For if there is no resurrection from the dead, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our faith is futile, and so is our preaching. In fact, those who... Hope in Christ, if Christ has not indeed been resurrected, are foolish. You might as well eat, drink, and be merry because tomorrow you die. But Christ has been raised indeed, the first fruits of those who will rise from the dead. And it is because they knew Christ rose from the dead And they were as certain about that as they were that they had skin upon their bones. They lived their life by a completely different standard. And they were able to turn an empire upside down. And let that be a challenge to you this afternoon. If you are a believer, you are animated by the power of the living God. And just as a first century remnant of scared, scattered disciples... Turn an empire upside down. So too can you. You are called an ambassador of Christ. Now, most of us are secret agents that have never blown our cover before the unregenerate world. But you're called an ambassador, not just an ambassador for a country, but for the King of kings and Lord of lords. You have the opportunity to allow the Holy Spirit to move through you in the process of giving a lost son or daughter of Adam the bread of life, the water of life. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for... USC Christian students on campus for sponsoring this event, for their commitment to you, and your kingdom principles. Father, thank you that as Christians we stand shoulder to shoulder with those who have embraced the essentials of the historic Christian faith. And in unis, we can say in essentials unity, non-essentials liberty, all things charity. Father, I pray that you will bless the Christian groups at USC. Father, may they recognize the potency, the dynamism, 
the dunamis within them to change the world, not by might nor by power, but by your Spirit. Father, we thank you for this time and pray that you'd bless the, the opportunity to engage in questions and answers in the next few minutes. And we pray this not by might nor by power, but by your Spirit, in Christ's name. There's a media-driven word uh, that is extant today, and we were hearing it uh, during the presidential uh, debates. Uh, last debate, this word cult was brought up. Uh, that term is driven uh, by a particular connotative meaning today, and therefore the term has become less and less useful. So we say uh, someone is part of a cult. What do you really mean by that? Because a cult can be defined sociologically. Think Heaven's Gate uh, or Jim Jones. A cult can also be defined theologically in the sense that it is a group of people that claim to be Christian but deny a central Christian doctrine. In fact, much to our shame as an organization, uh, when I took over the organization, a Christian Research Institute, we considered the local churches a cult. Um, we, we, we certainly thought that they were involved in cultic activities, although we didn't specifically use that word. Uh, that was our impression of the local church. Uh, and, and it's a highly inflammatory term that has huge ramifications for people. So we need to be very careful with the language we use. In, in, in the United States, it can have the ramification of really destroying relationships, familial relationships. You go to the Far East, and I've personally met people who have been imprisoned because they were falsely accused of being part of a cult, reading unauthorized material in unauthorized uh, places. So we need to be very careful with the language we use. Now, just to round out the story, in, in the case of uh, uh, Christians on campus, uh, for example, this is a organization that holds to essential Christian doctrine. There are other groups that may differ on secondary issues, but those are issues we debate vigorously. We don't have to divide over. So again, we need to keep in perspective in essentials unity, non-essentials liberty, and in all things charity.